Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be diving headfirst into the Whisperer's arc and the many twists and turns the adaptation took to get there. As per usual at this point, since effectively none of the characters are the same between the two versions, while direct comparisons do exist, the context of everything else will be drastically different. So don't be too surprised if some things seem odd when compared to their counterparts. It's just everything we've talked about thus far in the series compounding to create what is almost an entirely different story. All that said, so let us dive right in. When we left off, Dante along with a small squad, or Daryl, Jesus and Aaron in the show, were sent out to look for Ken, or Eugene in the TV version. And that is exactly where we'll pick up. In the show, they find Eugene in the barn and obviously want to get back as soon as possible. Only problem is, the walkers keep staying on their trail and no matter how much they try, they just can't seem to shake them. And it's here where Eugene drops his hypothesis that maybe the walkers are in some way evolving. Making an argument that the walkers need a blow to the brain to die, implying that to an extent it is still clearly functioning. And so, it isn't exactly out of the range of possibility that the zombie virus itself could have somehow mutated, allowing the walkers to redevelop some of these additional abilities. And right from the get-go, this entire hypothesis is entirely new for the show. And you know me, I always talk about meta implications this, meta implications that. And here, let me just spend a couple of minutes talking about the wider effect of this very simple addition that I have personally observed. The funny thing about it is that, just like the comic, by the end of the episode, we do in fact see one of the whispers unmasked. So clearly, even the TV-only people would have a pretty good argument against this whole walk revolution theory. That said though, I do think that ever since we saw the Whispers for the first time back in episode 6, they went a little overboard with trying to imply that the walkers are in fact changing. This is purely anecdotal evidence, so do take it with a grain of salt. But you have no clue how many people I've seen say that they almost dropped the show, or did drop the show, simply because they genuinely thought that the walkers were developing the ability to speak. As much as I may say, well, you're just being silly, the show literally showed you that there is a person underneath, that very factual statement unfortunately does not matter there. Just like with people who dropped the show after Glenn's death, yes, it was exactly like the comic, but that does not matter. The thing to remember when we talk about these sorts of things is that every single one of you watching this video are by default pretty hardcore Walking Dead fans. You're clearly seeking out additional analysis type content about the show and we are a relatively very small subset of viewers. The bulk of the audience are people who may not even know that the show comes from a comic and simply tune in on Sundays to watch The Zombie Show and for them that is it. To them, they like Glenn, Glenn died, and so they stopped watching, simple as that. And then, when it comes to these supposedly speaking walkers, I am honestly not even that surprised that people may drop the show, simply because it does go against everything we've seen this far, with the walkers always being slow, predictable, and dumb. It is the core, core appeal of The Walking Dead's apocalypse after all. There were never any of these sorts of special infected, and the danger comes from hordes and your fellow people. And again, factually, yes they are clearly wrong, but that does not matter. Because there is a part of the audience that made up their minds the second they spoke. And it's exactly things like these that I find so fascinating to look at through a retrospective lens. Because I honestly couldn't even tell you whether this whole intelligent walker debacle was deliberately meant as a red herring, or simply made sense coming from Eugene and so they wrote it in without too much thought. But whatever the case, I for one still find it amusing to occasionally see people mad about the walker speaking when they never did. Anyway, now that I've lost about 30% of viewers talking about random nonsense, let us get back to the good stuff. And here, just like I mentioned last time, the TV version, in my book at least, absolutely nailed the vibe. Much of this praise I think goes right to Bear McCreary, who somehow managed to create what is easily the most drastic tonal shift from any piece of music we had heard thus far, but man, does it perfectly encapsulate the unnerving nature of the whispers. As with many things in the comic, this entire confrontation is a lot less cooked up by design. And just like the Whispers in-universe, this whole thing catches us the readers off guard as well. Dante's squad finds the barn, but it's only Ken's belongings that are left behind. And just as suddenly, they are swarmed by walkers who they then proceed to pick off. 
There is no uneasy build-up or anything like that. This was supposed to be a basic mission that is suddenly interrupted by walkers. And a small detail that I think here is a really nice touch is how they immediately get into formation and start calling out steps. Which also works to remind us how well trained they are at this point. These are no longer just random dudes trying to keep watch. These are people who are trained to do this. Though as the horde begins to thin out, one of their blows is suddenly blocked. And before they can react, Doug and the other dude who no one cares about are promptly stabbed to death. And a quick reminder, all of this still takes place during the issue titled Happiness. So yes, Kirkman was being Kirkman as usual. Though now left to fend for himself, Dante continues flexing his sword skills and seemingly still manages to fight off all of them. After which, he goes to investigate one of the corpses and realizes that they are in fact wearing skin masks. A revelation that obviously shakes him to his very, very core. And before we or he can even gather his thoughts, he is held up by none other than Alpha with a very nice sawed-off dual shoddy telling him to not move. And with that, Dante is very much in a pickle. The show, on the other hand, does remain faithful to the fighting counter, but also takes some, I'll say, very significant departures. Just like the book, they get into formation of sorts and begin picking off the walkers. Though it's not long until they begin to get swarmed. And so, Jesus stays behind to hold them off while the others get through the gates. And just when everyone's gotten out, Jesus too begins making his way over there, cutting down the rest of the walkers in his way. That is, of course, until one of them dodges out of the way and stabs Jesus in the back in what is easily one of the greatest subversions the show has ever pulled off, in my opinion. Even knowing full well that these are the Whispers, I mean, I've read the comic, I know what's going on here. I never thought they would kill off Jesus of all people. And the fact that they didn't even allow us to linger on this moment is also just pure perfection. The dude dodges out of the way and stabs him all in the space of what, like three seconds? In my mind, it perfectly encapsulated that, oh, <coughs> moment from the box. Only here, it wasn't a random nobody from the hilltop. This was straight up Jesus, right? Though of course, as much as the death is huge and all that, I don't think there's many people out there who wouldn't agree that his character was extremely underutilized. And like I mentioned at the start of the season, it should not be surprising that this death is just Tom Payne wanting to leave the show, exactly because he never came close to his comic counterpart, neither in terms of importance or screen time. More on that in the second Season 9 video in case you missed it. That aside though, after Jesus' very sudden death, we get what is in my mind one of the greatest examples of the show leveraging the medium to just go over and above with what was there in the source material. Once the fight is seemingly over and Daryl pulls off the mask, we begin hearing the whispers. And it's not long until we hear them from all sides. It's that usual thing of the whispers becoming almost deafening and coming from all sides. And this is exactly why I love the concept of the whispers in either version. It's no secret that as we got further into the series, the walkers slowly went from the biggest threat to simply a backdrop and more of a chore that we have to deal with. And so, as their survivors gain more and more experience, they also become much more lax about dealing with them. Something I think we see quite well with Jesus here as well, with him appearing quite relaxed despite being surrounded. Again, the walkers are predictable, right? Think of it like speedrunning a video game. You just become desensitized to the threats because you know exactly how it will behave. And I think that's exactly what we see with our survivors. They just know what'll happen. But the genius thing about the Whispers is that they are not stronger or more capable than the Governor or Negan or any other villain in the show. Rather, they more so change how you perceive the very rules of the world we've been operating in. Suddenly, any walker can potentially be a whisper ready to pounce on you at any moment. And this one simple change makes this entire upcoming conflict just so much more complicated than any other one we've seen thus far. With the Savior War, you see saviors, you shoot. Simple as that. With the whispers, on the other hand, I mean, they are literally needles in a haystack. And in a meta sense, we've talked about some poorly done cliffhangers before, but personally, I think this one was honestly really, really well placed. I still remember that on initial viewing, I was absolutely buzzing with excitement to see how the community reacts to what comes next. Because again, this was a huge death compared to the books. 
So to sum this whole thing up, yes, Jesus' death was a complete waste in my book, but I do think that the show absolutely nailed the sequence as a whole. Everything from the music, to the fight choreography, to the whispers coming in, it was all incredible. But let me drop some quick foreshadowing for you. This whole suddenly killing off huge characters will be a huge double-edged sword for the rest of the series and resulted in what is a laughably low-stakes final season. More on that soon. But of course, the massive change here is that in the book, Dante is just straight up captured by Alpha herself and that is the last we hear of him for now. In the show, on the other hand, with a full day passing since they went out, Luke and Alden are growing restless about Michonne's squad and decide to ride out in search of them. They come across Yumiko's trail of arrows that, unfortunately for a little musical duo, leads them right to Alpha. And so, as they make it into this clearing, similar to the book, Alpha pulls out the double shoddy and captures them. The show also takes a different turn in meeting Lydia. In the book, we see Jesus check in with one of their patrol guards. They briefly talk about this dude, Nathaniel, I'm sorry I have no clue how to pronounce his name, but this is someone we actually met way, way back in issue 69 when we saw Abraham's construction crew. But that's beside the point. What's important is that he still hasn't checked in, which obviously prompts Jesus to be slightly worried, and so they ride off to make sure he is okay. Spoilers, he is not. And this is a tiny detail that I honestly loved, because we never hear about him again. We never find out what happens. He simply goes missing, and that's it. Normally, you just say, well, that's kind of sloppy writing, isn't it? Oh, someone died off screen, what genius writing. But to me, this is one of those tiny things that tell you that, unbeknownst to us, Alpha has already claimed her first victims without ever knowing who these people even are. Obviously, it's nothing major, but I think it's just some really neat flavor text, if you will, to tell us that the world is very much moving in the background as well. But yes, they all ride out to check on him, but as they continue going further and further beyond the borders, Jesus calls it. Saying that they might have just missed him along the way or something, and that this is getting a little bit sketchy. And of course, his intuition turns out to be right on the money, as the other dudes are yoinked off their horses one after another. And this is what inspired Jesus' final stand in the show. As here, he also goes absolutely ham on the walkers and whispers alike, going through like three to four dudes with a single blow. But while he fights for survival, one of them suddenly cries out about Joshua, prompting Jesus to ask, wait, you have names? And then continuing, hey, if any of you understand me, back off, obviously wanting to de-escalate the situation. But alas, no one responds, and Jesus just keeps on going through body after body after body. That is, until he hears, getting tired, can't fight forever. Suddenly, she goes to stab Jesus, but his spidey senses activate once more and he knocks the knife back into her arm, allowing him to finish off the remainder of the walkers in front of him. And as he turns around to finish off the girl who is now begging on the floor, we simply linger on the now near moments from collapsed Jesus as he chooses to spare her. Spoilers, this is Lydia, and Jesus takes both Darius, who is still bleeding out, and the now captive Lydia back to the hilltop. So yes, in case you didn't notice, Jesus is an absolute mega giga chat here, and he does literally fight off their entire group by himself with just that one sword. As for the show, because this is a much, much larger squad with many of our core fighters, they obviously don't run into Alpha herself just yet. Rather, after making their way out of the graveyard, they simply make their way back to the hilltop. Because again, others are already starting to get worried about them being gone so long. But as they make their way back, they run into another group of walkers. And like I talked about just a second ago, following this point, every single walker is a Schrodinger's walker, right? It could easily be a person, and that is exactly what we see here, with Daryl deliberately shooting them in the legs to see how they react. We get a mini fight here, but point is, this is where they meet Lydia, and just like the book, then take her back to the hilltop to interrogate her. Though, while everyone's at the hilltop worrying about this new major threat, we have our old major threat back at Alexandria also getting into his own little trouble. That, of course, being Negan. And this is where the show took a major departure from the books. Negan's cell is accidentally left unlocked, which in the show prompts him to go on his own little day trip. Judith does occasionally poof in to stop him, because clearly, nine years is more than enough to forget about how Carl died wandering around by himself, so no one should be keeping an eye on her. But even then, Negan does get the chance to wander around for a while. In the book, on the other hand, he never leaves the cell. 
Well, he does, but like literally 40 issues from where we are right now. As of right now though, the whole implication is that he notices that the gates hadn't been properly locked, and despite having the opportunity to leave, decides to push the cell open and simply wait. And coincidentally, after returning from the hilltop, Rick is the very first person to walk into the prison, where he is clearly absolutely shook about seeing Negan just casually relaxing with the gate being pushed open. Negan being Negan, of course he pokes fun at Rick, saying that old Grandpa Rick barely even has the strength to lift up the gun anymore, and then finishes by saying that if he wanted to, Rick would already be dead. Well okay, I lie because he puts it much more eloquently, which I will leave for you to find out on your own. What I will say though, is it involves Rick being a Thanksgiving turkey. So, you know. But yes, what Negan is trying to do here is rebuild trust, saying that he could have left, he could have caused havoc. Remember that in the book, the saviors still exist, he could have tried getting back to the sanctuary, but he never did any of it, saying that he hopes this builds trust. Rick, however, says that he is basically being naive and that he's done with this whole good Negan shtick. He then locks the doors, which Negan doesn't even attempt to contest. And the very final lines here are absolutely perfect. And I am just so sad that we never got to hear any of this in the show. As Rick leaves, Negan calls to him saying, Yeah, fine, keep me locked up as long as you like. But don't try to kid yourself into thinking that keeping me alive is some act of mercy. We both know that the only reason why I'm in this cage and not dead is because I am the only thing you can use to convince yourself you're still a good person. Only the greatest person on earth, the legendary Rick Grimes, could keep someone like me alive, right? And to top it all off, adding, remember that when you're screaming at that poor woman who left my cage unlocked. Remember that when you threaten to exile her, you monster. And man, you can tell me this isn't absolutely peak Negan. Not only that, I think lines like these would have immediately responded to a lot of criticism the TV series gets about Negan's imprisonment not making sense for a lot of people. Personally, I think the comic always made it a lot clearer that Rick saving Negan isn't some heroic sacrifice in the name of Carl or anything like that, but rather because he knew that putting him in a cell is quite literally the worst possible punishment for a person like Negan, while also still signaling the whole, we can move past killing each other. So in that sense, it is simply pragmatic above all else. At the same time, we must also remember that in the show, Negan's been in the cell for like 9-ish years now, while in the comic, it has only been around 2. So for us as the viewers, his whole pseudo-redemption arc does start much faster than it does in the book. Canonically though, he has been chilling in that basement for much, much longer in the TV version. As for his little day trip though, it is quite similar to the one he goes on way later in the book, but it is very much just this introspective thing of him trying to quite literally find his place in the world. And again, I have to give huge props to the sound design here, because I absolutely love that they mix that same disturbing motif of something to fear with this new upbeat song to immediately showcase the now different man that Negan has become. Another huge source of drama is Rosita and the whole love triangle slash square slash octagon that's going on here. In the book, we find out that she is pregnant with Sadiq's baby, and because there, she is actually together with Eugene, we almost exclusively focus on him and him just trying to grapple with the fact that she has cheated on him. Though he does ultimately promise to raise it as his own, only problem is, Eugene is of course super insecure about nearly every aspect of himself. So while he does try to support her and come off as composed, literally everyone around him knows that something is up. In the TV version, on the other hand, she is in a relationship with Gabriel rather than Eugene. But just like the book, she is also pregnant with Sadiq's baby. Eugene here is rather a wild card of sorts as he overhears that she is pregnant when she talks to Sadiq. And what complicates matters further is that at this point in time, Gabriel is still unaware of any of this. But okay, not to get stuck in the weeds too much, point is that there's a whole bunch of drama, but if there is just one thing you need to remember, it's just that Rosita is pregnant. This will be important later for… reasons. A massive remix for the show is all the teenage drama going on at the hilltop, because 
you know, Carl and Sophia are kind of dead. But yes, if you remember the whole bully stuff from last time, this is where it becomes very important. After learning that Carl is staying in the hills up for the foreseeable future, Sophia and him begin catching up and generally spending a lot more time together and reminisce about everything they've been through. And while they're having this little picnic, one of the bullies, Brandon, decides to embrace his inner Joel and bonks Carl over the head with a brick. Now, I am no doctor, but I am pretty sure getting the back of your head bashed with a brick would have either instantly rendered you unconscious or killed you on the spot. But whatever the case, clearly, Carl is dazed, and as soon as he gets his bearings, he just runs off. Sophia, being the Giga Chad that she is, begins fighting back. Only problem is, there are two of them, and this time, they did get the upper hand. And as the other dude holds her back, the little psycho Brandon begins to explain how last time, she beat them up. And this time, they'll just say they got a little carried away with getting her back. And as he begins to repeatedly punch her and kick her, we suddenly see a shovel appear in the background. That is then followed by the other dude being bonked over the head with it as none other than Carl is back. And oh boy, did these guys get in over their heads because when he comes back, he is fueled by pure rage. So even as they begin to beg in what is honestly just about as disturbing as Negan swinging the bat, Carl just keeps bashing them with the spade. Though again, this is the post time skip Carl, so as much as he is absolutely ruthless, he does realize the consequences of his actions. So after coming out of this rage-filled daze, he gets Sophia out of there and in a quite bleak tone simply tells Maggie, the two boys, they attacked her. I think I killed them. Keep in mind that Sophia is Maggie's daughter, so when she spits up blood telling her that Carl saved her and then collapses, Maggie clearly could not care less about what Carl is saying and simply wants to make sure that she is taken care of. Though, as you'd also suspect, as much as Carl did simply want to protect Sophia, obviously he went a little overboard, and that fact is not lost on anyone. And while Maggie is still 100% on his side, she also says that he must realize that what he did is terrible, and that they just can't keep doing things like that anymore saying that this is exactly what Rick is working toward. Yes, those two are both a waste of space, but they are still kids. They'll grow up and hopefully things will change. Society simply can't function if every one of these mess-ups is punished by a spade to the face. And with that, Maggie imprisons Carl, both for his protection since Tammy and Morton are both losing their minds, as well as to simply make a bit of an example out of him. And again, it's not like Carl doesn't realize he did go a little bit psycho, so he ultimately does not even try to protest that much either. In the show, Henry does very much take Carl's role here, only instead of him going Negan mode with the spade, he gets drunk, kills a walker and whatnot, and ultimately gets thrown in a cell for being irresponsible. But point is, he too is locked up for a few days, which neatly sets up everything to follow with Lydia. And speaking of which, here I want to once again note the whole all stories converge aspect of the comic. Because it is as Sophia is being taken to the hospital that Jesus arrives back with Lydia. So again, it's just yet another thing Maggie now has to deal with. At this point, it is the upcoming fair, her daughter almost being beaten to death, the Rose family beginning to conspire with Gregory, who, don't forget, is still alive in the book, and now to top it all off, Jesus bringing in one of the whispers for questioning. And as you'd suspect, all of these storylines will of course blow up at exactly the same time. In both versions, Lydia is interrogated, though the wider story of course differs substantially, with the only commonality being the character of Lydia, but even that is remixed. This might just be a me thing, but Lydia to me always seemed much more disturbed in the show. Maybe because that extra degree of separation was taken away as I was now watching a live human actually acting these scenes out or some other reason, but in the comic, she simply seemed so traumatized that when she was spoken to here, she was just distant. She wasn't distraught, she was just blank. We'll get to some of her extremely twisted backstory in a second, but even from the single panel, I think you should already have a pretty good idea of how she speaks and how she carries herself. Not for a second does she try to hide anything or try to trick them or anything. She simply sits there with a blank stare and answers every single question without even flinching. We even get this brief exchange of Jesus asking, so your group sends out children? There can't be that many of you if you're being sent out to the front lines. And oh boy Jesus, do I agree with you, would be a shame if we had a small child running around on their own, huh? 
Lydia, though, responds by simply saying that there are no quote-unquote children anymore. Childhood was a luxury that no one could ever really afford. In the show, on the other hand, instead of this just being a straightforward questioning, Daryl pulls a bit of a 300 IQ play as he allows Henry to talk to her while he simply listens in, effectively still gathering the same exact information. Though the big difference here between Carl and Henry is that Carl never mentions anything about their communities or anything like that. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Rather, they simply talk about their personal lives. Since both of them are in here because they harm people, they more so just talk about what will happen to them and how their community doesn't kill people anymore. And as their conversation continues, Lydia's stoic, emotionally distant persona begins to fade away, as she admits that, yes, she is scared. The Joshua guy she cried out about as Jesus fought them was her friends, and in short, they just connect over the things they've both been through. The show, on the other hand, of course decided to throw in some extra flashbacks here, which, just like with almost every other flashback, is TV show exclusive. As we've talked about before, Kirkman has always done the whole characters actually retelling their experience rather than explicitly showing it. And oh boy, usually, I would say that maybe some of these flashbacks should have been left as this unexplained thing. As again, we humans tend to already imagine the worst possible scenario imaginable that no amount of tragedy could ever match. But in this case, I think they absolutely nailed the horror with the whole switcheroo we see in her story, and how Alpha was actually always the gaslighter in the family. And by the way, I'm guessing most of you will have at least heard about this, but in case you haven't, the third episode of Tales of the Walking Dead explains their backstory even further. It is by no means required watching, and I know for some caused more confusion than anything else, as it does leave things in the timeline either very ambiguous or straight up retconny, but that's beside the point. The comic, on the other hand, takes a much different approach to this whole ordeal. The show, too, has the whole thing of Henry freeing Lydia and them going on their brief adventure where they eat worms and whatnot, but the comic book makes this whole thing a little more explicit with Carl actually bargaining with Maggie to free her and that he would look after her. And very symbolically, once Lydia begins to share more about herself and open up to Carl, he even goes as far as to bring her the sheriff's hat. He basically talks about how it's the hat that always kept him safe and effectively immortal, with him suffering two gunshots and about 50 other things they've been through. But yes, our boy Carl has very much fallen for her. And following this, in what I think was meant to directly mirror the picnic Carl just had with Sophia, we see them both chilling together and continuing to share more about their past. Carl talks about him getting shots, which then prompts Lydia to ask whether she can see it. And while Carl, as we've seen before, is insecure at first, she then takes off his glasses and then proceeds to lick his eye sockets. Don't ask. And they then proceed to have some fun. And it's here where things get very, very dark. Because when we check back in with them, she says that it was nice and that's not how usually they do things. This obviously prompts Carl to ask, wait, what are you saying? To which Lydia responds by talking a little more about how their camp worked and how the other men on the camp, you know. Yes, it is very, very messed up. These are the whispers after all, and they literally call each other Alpha and Beta. And obviously, after hearing this, Carl is more than dead set on never letting her return to the whispers. Which, as you'd expect, is exactly what will set off the rest of this arc to transpire. And to all of you TV onlys, you can also probably see why Carl is absolutely instrumental in everything that happens here. Most of the things to follow will be spearheaded by his actions. And speaking of which, following his rampage against the two bullies, the Rose family are fed up with Maggie's leadership and finally agree to go along with Gregory's plan of killing Maggie. In short, this is where the Maggie storyline at the very start of the season comes from, only instead of some rando dying on a mission out of nowhere, all of this is again a direct result of Carl's actions. Though they then set up this whole scheme where Maggie would go to meet with Gregory, who'd claim that he would be trying to smooth things over with the roses. But of course, this is Gregory, so in reality, this whole meeting only has one goal. To poison Maggie. Luckily though, because this is Gregory, he is incompetent and fails even that. And even more luckily, Jesus is also here and proceeds to then dropkick him into oblivion. And yes, obviously he is immediately imprisoned. 
And again, note how all of these conflicts, both internal and external, are converging at the same exact time. Which is largely the reason why, despite my love of Season 9, I do still prefer the comics version of most of these events. Much of this is of course totally external, as both Laura and Cohen and Andrew Lincoln wanted to leave the show, so they simply couldn't have had this plot going along at the same time as The Whisperers. But man, the climax the book sets up here is something else entirely. Though yes, the final thing we'll talk about today is the first formal confrontation between Alpha and the joint communities. In both versions, she just appears at Hilltop's gates. Only difference being that, in the comic, she returns Dante and Ken, while in the show, it is of course Alden and Luke. And yes, quite the plot twist here. Not only is Ken alive, they even patched up his leg to the point that the Hilltop doctors would later say they clearly knew what they were doing. Though the exchange as a whole plays out extremely similarly, bar the obvious differences in characters. With the comic featuring just Maggie and Alpha, while the show has Daryl take the main role. Also in both versions, we see Carl slash Henry protest giving up Lydia as per Alpha's demands. But of course, neither Daryl or Maggie in the book are ready to fight for Lydia, who barely anyone even knows. On top of that, this is a two-for-one trade, with her explicitly claiming that the goal of this is to ensure no conflict. So from their perspective, no matter how tragic Lydia's story and how much Carl protests, at this point in time, this is clearly the safest call. Another change here is that the show goes a little further in portraying Alpha as just pure evil. As once Lydia calls her mother, she proceeds to hit her saying that, you call me Alpha just like everyone else. In the comic on the other hand, she never hits her and simply says the line while turning away. And this small detail was super interesting to me. Because I still remember that the first time we met Alpha in the books, I was super caught off guard because she genuinely seemed to care for her daughter and I mean, she showed up at our gates, right? But at the same time, the stories Lydia told about what she had to live through is just about the most horrifying thing you can imagine. Which obviously prompted the question of, who are we even dealing with here? Conversely, the show very explicitly showed you that even Alpha herself is more than fine with hitting her. Which immediately dispelled that illusion, because clearly, this whole getting your daughter back was nothing more than a personal agenda and not out of any care for her. But of course, when we first read this, we barely had anything to read into as the Whisperers had only appeared a handful of times thus far, we never got any flashbacks, and there were already plenty of theories about Lydia potentially being an inside agent, sent to simply spy on the communities and that every single thing she has said is a complete lie. And this little theory was also further strengthened by the fact that her emotions seemed to be extremely conveniently tailored to get Carl's sympathy. But yes, point is that, I do think that the comic Alpha did seem a little less straight up evil when we first met her at least. Though yes, with that, Lydia along with the rest of the Whisperers all walk off and seemingly conflict has indeed been avoided. Except it hasn't, because both Carl and Henry go right after them, and this is where we'll pick up next time. I am like 90% sure at this point that Season 9 might have the most parts of any season thus far, but what can you do, there is just too much to talk about. That said though, all the pieces are now in motion, so from here on out, it is full on Whisper territory. And oh boy, am I buzzing to get to the faithful border scene. And that's the video. Oh boy, we are quickly getting close to the infamous triple dot issue and I could not be more excited. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, KJ Doms. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye